There we go. And uh, uh, Susan, would you please introduce our guest speaker for tonight? Sure, I'd be happy to, Ron. It's my pleasure to introduce Dr. John Feenstra again tonight. Many of you already know John as a terrific birder and a pioneer of Southern California birding. From the mountains to the deserts to the ocean, John has birded it all. John is co-author of the essential checklist to the pelagic birds of Southern California. John was raised in New Jersey, and sometimes you can still hear that Jersey accent coming through. And in high school, John was introduced by a teacher to birds. But despite his strong interest and talent for birds and birding, John pursued academics where he excelled in physical chemistry and eventually moved to Pasadena and earned his PhD from Caltech. While studying, he became very active in Southern California birding. And after completing his PhD, it wasn't long before John declared that it was birds that were really his full-time passion. And he boldly left the corporate world and lucky for us, he returned to Southern California. Today, John is an ecological consultant and travels the world as a senior tour leader for Wings Birding Tours. And I can personally say that he's a superb tour leader. Los Angeles Birders is very pleased to have John as a valuable member of our board as well as our speaker tonight. So please welcome Dr. John Feenstra. Hello, everyone. Uh, let me just share my screen here. Okay. And, and let's go. Okay. So uh, thank you all in attendance and uh, those of you in the future, welcome. Um, I'm going to talk about uh, some streaky finches tonight. Um, so first I'll just talk a little bit about finches. Uh, it's uh, finches uh, are the family Fragilidae. Uh, they are a, it's a global family with some uh, 43 gen genera and approximately 168 species. Um, they are largely small songbirds, uh, sexually dimorphic with conical bills that eat seeds. Um, and there, of course, there are some, some exceptions to that. Uh, familiar finches are the canaries and the goldfinches and siskins and crossbills uh, and, the, and the rose finches. Um, but also things like the, um, well, the Hawaiian honey creepers are finches and uh, the South American euphonias and chlorophonias, a blue naped chlorophonia in this picture. Um, figured I'd have a non streaky finch to start things off. Um, the, uh, the world's most famous finches, the, the Darwin finches of Galapagos are tanagers. So they're, they're not finches, but uh, these, these are uh, the rest of them. Uh, and um, more specifically, uh, I'm gonna talk about the Hemoris finches, which, um, uh, in 2012, uh, was split from the uh, old world rose finches, the Carpodicus finches. So the three Hamoris finches, house finch, uh, purple finch, and Cassin's finch are the, uh, are the, the rose finches of the, uh, of the Americas. And uh, the remaining Carpodicus finches uh, remain uh, in the old world with their genetic differences. Um, so they're uh, the, these species are um, uh, often easy to see. Uh, they often occur together. Um, they, uh, are, they are different, but they're similar enough that uh, they are some of the, I guess, the, the, the most uh, notorious and um, uh, easy uh, misidentifications of, of new birders. And, um, and I guess, you know, sometimes, you know, older birders too, but uh, it's, uh, they, 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 they have their problems. So uh, that's the, the topic of tonight's talk. We'll, we'll hopefully have that all, uh, all ironed out for you. Uh, I'm going to start with the photo quiz and then, uh, which is going to be five, five different uh, finches and then um, move on to some status and distribution. Uh, plumage sounds, and then if I have enough time, which hopefully I will, I'm going to try to. I'm going to. I'm going to beat this to death, but I'll try to get this. Uh, get this in in an hour, um, of uh, some non hamorous uh, streaky finches that uh, could be encountered around here. So first, I'm going to move on to the pole and quiz finch number one, and uh, somebody out there, maybe Ron, will have uh, have the pole up. There you go. I don't know, maybe some, uh, you got any smooth jazz for us? 
<laughs> Unfortunately, I don't. But I can sing if you like. <laughs> yeah, do it. <laughs> mm, I don't know. I'm... I think maybe we ought to ask Mark for the thing to Jeopardy. Yeah, where's the saxophone? <laughs> so um, people are answering away. We have we have about sixty percent of the votes in right now. So please, we'll have about five more seconds. Four, three, get your votes in. Two. Oh, um, I forgot to put Mallard on. Thanks, Jake. I should have. But uh, next time, next time, two and one, and that's the end of the poll. All right, uh, and we're going to come back to these later in the talk as I deal with these things. So, all right, num oops, uh, number, oops, got head there, number two. Okay, and here's the poll. The. Uh, Votes are coming in already. Identifications, excuse me, are coming in already. So far, we have over 50%. A lot of hip shooters. Okay, five more seconds. Get your votes in. Four, three, two. Come on, come on, come on. One, and that is it. Okay, John. All right, here comes number three. So, yeah, there it is. Okay, here's the poll. Uh, this one is perplexing to many people out there. <clears throat> Not coming in quite as fast, but now we're starting an avalanche of answers. Please get your answers in. We always have spa. How do you say that, John? Hamorhes? Well, I actually, I have no idea how to say it, but oh, um, okay. I, I, I've I pronounced it Hamorhes. Hamorhes. Hamorhes spa down yeah. the bottom. Okay, four, three, two, and one. Okay. John? Oh, all right. Okay, number four. Okay. Here's number four. Uh, answers are flowing in, are fluttering in, even as we speak. We always have spa down at the bottom. Like it's inches to a feeder. <laughs> exactly. Okay, a few more seconds. Four, three, two. He he mo he mo row us. He he mo row us. He mo row us. He mo row us. He mo row us. Thank you, Kimball. So he mo row us spa, and uh -huh. one. <laughs> That's the end of the poll. Okay. And, and five. And here it is. Oh, people know this one. We already are zipping up around, fluttering up around uh, 50, 60%. 70, 70, few more seconds. Four, three, two, and one. Great. There you okay. Go. Okay. All right. Well, let's talk house finches. Um, house finches are uh, one of the most widespread and familiar birds in in North America. You know, Mexico, the U.S., continental U.S., Canada. They've been introduced to Hawaii. Uh, they are the quintessential backyard bird uh, at you know every every bird feeder in the country, pretty much. Um, they are very happy what we've done with the place. Uh, they they uh, are 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 very satisfied with sprawl, and they're um, they've they've rapidly expanded uh, from um, their introduction in the, into uh, Long Island in in 1939 to uh, colonize uh, Eastern North America, 
uh, they have uh, very much taken over. And um, you know, whatever we keep doing, they love it. So uh, there are uh, currently 11 recognized subspecies of, of house finch. Um, uh, the closest, well, we have, we have uh, uh, Hemororus mexicanus frontalis uh, over most of uh, the, the, the North American range. Uh, San Clemente Island has a recognized house finch subspecies, as does uh, Guadalupe Island uh, off of northern Mexico, the remaining subspecies being in little pockets down in, uh, in southern Mexico. Um, they've pretty much Pretty much here's the here's the uh, this is the eBird detection map. Um, they love our sprawl. Um, they have uh, a high uh, a genetic diversity, which has made them you know allowed them to be extremely adaptable, uh, as well as uh, survive plagues like the um, mycoplasmosis outbreak in the uh, in the 1990s. And if you're not watching this live, um, I encourage you to uh, to pause this, watch Allison Schultz's presentation from January. And then come back to this uh, presentation. So to get the uh, the background on uh, on the uh, the indestructible house finch. Um, so uh, if you're doing that right now, um, great. And then I guess you're back. So um, the uh, detections are, like I said, pretty much everywhere. There's a couple of little missing rectangles down here in the middle of Lake Michigan and the Sea of Cortez. So if you you know got you got something that you want to do, you can go out there and tick house finch for these little squares. Um, you can see, yeah, they've been introduced to Hawaii, uh, but are, are coast to coast all the way from southern Mexico uh, through the, basically to the, to the boreal forests of, uh, of, of Canada. Um, let me flick to the next one here. This is the abundance uh, map from eBird. So just showing where the house finches are the most numerous. It gives a little bit more detail, but you can see that the, the southwestern United States, uh, northern, northern Mexico is really like there's a, there's, a, there's a core abundance to house finches there. And they really have expanded out from that as, uh, as uh, humans have, uh, have altered the environment and built uh, suburbs and sprawl and put bird feeders in the yards and all that stuff. And, and uh, likewise expanded from their original introduction to uh, uh, to New York in 1939 to cover uh, the Eastern United States. Uh, interestingly, you see these little pockets in the uh, in the Midwest, uh, where uh, around around cities, uh, uh, Oklahoma City and uh, you know, Dallas and Houston have have you know, uh, expansive uh, suburban sprawl, and and there's 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 intense uh, some more house finch intensity uh, intensity there. They're basically non-migratory, but will retreat from. Uh, harsh places in the winter to find bird feeders, basically. So flip to the next one. Uh, here in Los Angeles, they are also pretty much everywhere. Um, there's a couple of missing blocks up in the, the highest part of the highest part of the San Gabriels and maybe up in the very northern parts of maybe inaccessible areas of Tahone Ranch and Edwards Air Force Base, but uh, a bird of essentially every habitat in um, in, in LA nesting in everything from choya cactuses out in the desert to uh, uh, old rain gutters and flower pots and uh, all sorts of construction sites. Uh, so they're, uh, they are uh, very happy and successful here. Um, purple finch, uh, also a pr pretty familiar bird of, um, uh, of North America is uh, uh, another feeder bird uh, also um, but occurs in coniferous and mixed coniferous forests. Uh, there are two subspecies of purple finch, the uh, Californicus, which is on the west coast of uh, the U.S. and Canada, and then uh, the nominate purpureus across the boreal forests of Canada and into the northeast. Uh, purple finches are um, much more migratory, uh, and they pull out of the, the, their, their northern, their Canadian range uh, and winter widely in the eastern United States. So they actually have quite a, quite a large range throughout the, uh, throughout the east in the, in the winter. Um, and you can see the, rain, the ranges of the two subspecies here, the, the, from, from southern British Columbia down to, well, I guess it makes it to very northern Mexico, so the Californicus, and the, the rest is nominate purpureus. Um, this is uh, the eBird detections of eastern purple finch. Uh, and I'm going to get into the identification of the two subspecies uh, in the presentation. And I didn't sleuth out all of these outlier points. 
uh, to find out if these are, you know, what the, what the documentation is like. But as a, as a migratory bird uh, and as one that's a, a subspecies that is you know, more or less identifiable, at least sometimes, uh, they are, they do show up places, you know, uh, outside of their, uh, their, their core migration route, I suppose, including a few records here in California. Uh, so not a, uh, not an unknown bird of the West and, uh, overlaps a little bit with Western purple finch, which is, uh, which is the detections are mapped here. Uh, also some extra limital records. I just, I, when I was, when I was looking at these slides earlier today to make sure I had everything in order, I noticed that there's one actually up here in Russia. And uh, I didn't go back to check out what sort of uh, documentation they had on that, but that's kind of interesting. Uh, but again, as less, as a less migratory bird, um, it uh, has, has predictably fewer uh, extra limital uh, dots outside of its outside of its regular range, but it does make it east of California, say Arizona and you know, a couple of the, there's these other spots out in here. Um, here in Los Angeles, it is uh, uh, it's a it's a bird of woodlands, as I said, mixed uh, coniferous and uh, 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 woodlands. So it's in uh, throughout our San Gabriel Mountains, the in the north slope of the western sand, which if there still are forests there. I don't know. There might not even be any more trees left over there after fires to uh, to have any more purple finches. But at least there used to be during the LA Green Bird Atlas. Um, yeah, widespread through the uh, the the San Gabriels, Eastern San Gabriels, um, down to the to the foothills. Uh, there, I don't have any in my yard this spring and in here in Altadena. But I did. Uh, they were they were singing around my neighborhood last year. Um, again, a, a common feeder bird. Um, you know, a whole, a whole bunch of them from this winter um, out of Riverside County. There's some breed over here in, in Malibu in the, the canyons of uh, around, around Point Doom. I guess I sort of expected to see them breeding in uh, maybe like uh, Palisades, like Rustic Canyon maybe, but I don't know, maybe they do now. Um, anyway, um, so Casson's Finch, uh, named after uh, John Casson of the, uh, the Philadelphia uh, Academy of Sciences. Um, I'll I use this same uh, classic slide of Philadelphia if I ever do an identification of Philadelphia vireos, um, uh, described in the, the mid 1800s and, and named for John Casson, the uh, famous ornithologist and taxonomist. Um, it has uh, quite a large range through the uh, interior mountain west, um, sort of uh, open, drier coniferous forests. Uh, it doesn't really have uh, much range onto the coast, except for up here near uh, Oregon and California and the Cascades, and then down here where we are in, the, in Southern California, the transverse ranges, its range gets pretty close to, uh, to the coast. But as you can see, is largely a, uh, a bird of uh, in interior mountains, some seasonal movements um, uh, into to lower elevations in the, uh, uh, in the winter, but, but largely uh, 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 largely a resident bird. Uh, it is. It is also monotypic. So whereas the other ones had subspecies, this one has not. Uh, it is a uh, here in Los Angeles County, a breeder in the highest elevations of the coniferous forests in the eastern San Gabriel San Gabriel Mountains, like uh, you know seven thousand feet ish and uh, and up, uh, where it is a pretty you know not an uncommon bird. Uh, definitely, definitely findable, and that's a that's a nice thing about about all three of these species is that in the in their ranges they're they're uh, fairly easy to find, not particularly shy. So okay, here is a, a typical year. I just picked 2018 and 2019 uh, for Southern California, uh, and these are just the eBird detections uh, on the on the on the. Uh, map. Um, there are sort of the, the, the core breeding resident areas of Cassin's finches throughout the uh, San Gabriel, San Bernardino, San Jacintos, and, and down to Lagunas and in San Diego. Uh, and then a few outlier points where these things uh, uh, wander in the, in the non-breeding season. Some of these uh, desert oases and uh, there's one out here at the Salton Sea. Really not too much on the coast though. There's one over here and it's interior Orange County. Um, and then one down here a little bit into, into uh, the coastal uh, slope of San Bernardino County, but, but basically uh, a bird of the, the mountains. And then when it wanders, it wanders inland to the deserts. However, in the last year, and you have to, I, 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 
got this map like a month or two ago. So it's got all these red points for recent records. Um, and uh, they're, you know, I, I didn't get an updated map. Uh, but what you can see, at least from the last year, is that there was, a, there was a, an eruption of Cassin's Finches onto the coastal slope out here into Ventura County, uh, into the, the, the coastal part of the Santa Clara River Valley, um, down here in coastal San Diego County, uh, as well as the usual points in the mountains and out in the deserts. But there was, there was a bit of an event uh, this year. In fact, uh, it, uh, those of you who are at Bear Divide, uh, often there were they were almost daily at uh, uh, passing through Bear Divide, so that was uh, that was kind of cool, um, but kind of a thing that uh, uh, puts puts Cassin's finches away from where they where they sometimes are. So onto uh, the identification part of this, what do these things actually look like? Uh, basically, males are red and the females and the matures are 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 brown and uh, brown and streaky. Um, the uh, uh, let's see here. Uh, they have general the general differences of of the, the finches. And this is whether they're male or females. Is that Cassin's finch is bigger than purple finch, which is bigger than house finch. Uh, one of the things we look for um, is the the curvature of the colman, the ridge on the upper mandible, uh, which is curvier in house than it is in purple than it is in Cassin's. Um, uh, and, uh, uh, field mark that I, I find to be very useful um, and not usually, it doesn't seem to be highly, highlighted as much in so many field guides is the, uh, is the presence of an eye ring, uh, which is sometimes on a house finch, very, very rarely if ever in a purple finch and almost always a Cassin's finch. I found that to be a very useful field mark. Um, streaking on the back, Cassin's is a streakier bird and of course songs and calls. Uh, the males, when we look at male finches, um, we're looking at the position and the intensity of the red feathering, uh, streaking on the flanks uh, and on the undertail and uh, streaking on the back. Um, females, we're looking at uh, the, the facial pattern. Uh, is there a supercilium or a, or a mustache that's uh, bringing, that's making the, uh, the, the ear, the cheek patch, the auricular or the malar stripes stand out? Uh, and then what are the, what do the streaks look like on the underparts and what is the, the base color of those feathers? Um, so that's kind of what we're going to be doing in the next several slides. Um, and let me, ah, here we go. So the, these are male finches. Uh, there's a house finch on the left, a purple finch on the top right, and a Cassin's finch on the, on the lower right. Uh, you can get uh, an idea of the, the field marks that I just rattled off by looking at these. You can see these are pretty good examples, very typical looking uh, males of, uh, you know, with a, with a slightly curved culmin on the house finch, straighter on a purple finch, and very, very straight and angular on the Cassin's finch. Uh, you can see a little bit of an eye line on the house finch, or an eye ring, I'm sorry, an eye ring on the house finch, a little bit of, or, or no eye ring on the purple finch, and then a kind of a prominent eye ring on the Cassin's finch. Uh, which has a very streaky back, streakier than purple finch and, and much streakier than, cast and, uh, than house finch. Uh, streaking on the underparts, it's, um, it's brown on the house finch and uh, brownish, a little bit purple on the purple finch and very, very fine, uh, if at all, on the cast and finch. So I'm going to show a few pictures of these things and go through each species just to show different examples. Uh, and that hopefully that'll be helpful in looking at these things. So. Here is a house finch and um, pretty, pretty typical looking bird. Uh, it's got uh, a lot of red around its face and, and on a house finch, the, the red is, is concentrated on the, the head and the throat. Uh, if you look at th this bird on the right, you can see that there is, it, it fades a little, the red fades a little bit onto the breast, but by the time you get to the belly, there's, there's no more red feathering. Uh, and likewise, if you look at the back of the bird, there's red on the head, and maybe a little bit on the nape, but when you get to the mantle, and certainly by the time you get all out to the wings, there's no more, there's no more reddish feathers. Um, there's, this bird doesn't really show any kind of eye ring. Uh, the, the colman is, 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 is somewhat curved. Uh, streaking on the flanks is a, sort of a dull, smudgy gray brown over kind of an off white color, a little bit of uh, streaking out into the undertail coverts. So pretty typical looking house finch. Uh, um, just another one uh, showing the, the, the this house finch is showing its red rump. They usually do have a red rump. Um, 
as the the, the other ones. Uh, it's often concealed by uh, by the by the wings, but this one's cleaning itself, so it's uh, it's it's showing off its cool red rump feathers. Um, on the uh, the back of the house fence, you can see that there's there's like there's some indistinct streaking. It's pretty pretty dull and gray brown. Maybe a, a little bit of streaks, but not too much. Um, this one on the left, well, actually, it's the same bird, just a different different posture. has a has a It looks like it has this sort of. Uh, it kind of does have a paler supercilium red, make kind of a ring around its head, but just uh, just some some variation. Um, here's a few more uh, various uh, plumages and angles. Um, this the middle one is uh, might be might be a young male. Um, the uh it's it's not not nearly as uh as bright as the uh as the birds on the left and the right uh which you can see the, the one on the right has uh has kind of distinct streaking uh where they're they're pretty pretty sharply defined and the one on the left is kind of the other end of that where it's really quite uh quite smudgy but um but all sort of that same dull brown color no red feathers out into the wings and onto the back and and basically, it's the the red feathering stops at the uh, at the breast and doesn't reach onto the belly. So, let's see here. You've probably also seen if you're looking at house finches, which they're pretty hard not to look at if you're birding pretty much anywhere. Uh, you've seen an orange or a yellow one. And uh, as um, uh, Allison Schultz described in her previous talk and uh, in the first house finch talk as well, uh, the um, uh, coloration of uh, house finches uh, comes from these um, orange and yellow and red carotenoid pigments that are metabolized from their diet. Uh, and variations in diet and in the metabolism of these birds can change their, uh, you know, change their colors from uh, in anywhere in the yellow to, to red spectrum, uh, depending on what they eat. And that can, that can change from year to year. So um, you could have these finches could be uh, could be red uh, now, um, and uh, that's kind of a that's kind of an interesting thing. Um, but you just replace the yellow with the red, and you have pretty typical looking uh, house finches. And this is a common it's a common variation. Um, let me get on to the next one. And in fact, quiz finch number one is a male house finch. Um, uh, Ron, can you tell me how people did on this? Uh -huh. are, All right. So the results. Okay, so I'll narrate this for people who are um, who are uh, not on the uh, on the Zoom call. Uh, so fifty three percent house finch, three percent purple finch, eighteen percent cassins finch, six percent house purple, nine percent purple cassins, three percent house cassins, and nine percent. Hymorous spa. <laughs> so um, I mostly, yeah. If you if you got house finch in there, you know you got it right. And just adding all of those up really quick in my head is uh, seventy one percent had house finch in there. So that's uh, that's pretty good. I picked this one. This was a, my my bird feeder in my backyard, and I picked this one specifically because it had some of the things that we commonly attach to, uh, to, to the identity of a Cassin's finch and that the, and the, in, this, in this bright light that the red on the, the fore crown was really standing out. Cassin's finch usually has this like bright cap. Uh, and then it also is, is pretty boldly marked down through the undertail coverts. Now house finches are also boldly marked through the undertail coverts just like Cassin's finches are, but they have uh, males are uh, males are, are actually not very well marked. That's more of a that's more of a characteristic of female finches. Uh, and male Cassin's finches are, are are nearly they're very finely marked, if at all, on the uh, on the belly and flanks. Uh, the the culmen of this bird is fairly curved. There's not much, no real eye ring to see, and the back feathers can't see at all. Red stops at the breast. So uh, this is a uh, this one is a house finch. But it seems like most of everybody already knows that, so that's good. All right, let's go to uh, purple finches. So I picked uh, some, some pretty variable purple finches here. Um, a uh, intensely purple purple finch um, and a pretty dull purple finch. Uh, but these, and uh, these are both purple finches uh, photographed in uh, this, this winter. I think, I'm pretty sure Frank's was photographed this winter. I know, I know Brittany's was. Um, 
but this just shows the, the, the variation of these birds. So when you're looking at uh, one of these as a, as a, a male, a male purple finch, um, well, if you're just looking at a purple finch, you know, things to keep in mind are the, are the, the, the Coleman Ridge, which is mostly straight, maybe a little bit of curve, no real eye ring um, to, to speak of, um, smudgy markings down the flanks present in both birds, um, and uh, red feathers. Uh, the, red, the red suffusion from this purple finch is just all over the place. Uh, but this one is much more limited. I'm sure if we saw it from the back, it'd have it show a little bit more, but it, it would, it, you could see a little bit of reddish feathers into the wings here, which is a thing that um, uh, purple finches and cassins finches will have, but house finches will not. Um, and a little bit of the facial pattern is visible in this bird, the a brighter supercilium and, and mustache, a little bit on this one too, but they're, but it's pretty, that can be pretty subtle. So let me, uh, move on. So these are more some some typical pretty pretty bright purple finches. Again, looking at uh, smudgy flanks, um, suffusion of red feathers from the uh, from the head area down into the back and wings. Now this one's got you can see the red rump, it's got red in the tail feathers. Uh, it's also a pretty a pretty bright bird like the one on the previous page. Um, uh, uh, the supercilium on these birds is more pronounced. Uh, as well as the uh, as the mustache kind of bringing out this uh, this cheek patch or the uh, the auricular area uh, streaking on the back is a lot more than would be in a, in a male house finch the dark centered feathers uh, with these uh, paler reddish edges gives these uh, the streaked appearance on the back which is a lot more uh, pronounced than uh, than it is in uh, in house finch uh, again just some some variation these are duller birds. But again, um, you can see a uh, the the suffusion of uh, of red feathers from the head down into uh, the back and in the wings in both birds. Smudgy marks, relatively unmarked on the undertail coverts. Um, I mentioned earlier about wing length. I'm going to talk a little bit more about that here. Uh, you know, a, a, a slightly longer wing look. I find this thing to be a, that to be a somewhat of a difficult. Uh, mark to judge in the field or even some from some from some photographs just because when birds are changing postures those uh their 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 posture actually change can change the way their you know the the the, the general impression of their uh, of their wing length but what it does is when the wings are longer it makes the tail look shorter and makes the bird look plumper and and uh, uh cassin's finch uh is is the uh uh, therefore is the roundest of the three. Um, but here, yeah, look at lack of eye ring, um, uh, straightish uh, Coleman on, the, on both of these birds. So these are, these are purple finches. And quiz finch number four is a purple finch. So how did we do on this one, Ron? <clears throat> Go. Ah, interesting. Okay, good. All right. So we had uh, quite fifty six percent thought this was a house finch. Only twenty five percent said this was a purple finch, and uh, and then a few few here and there for the rest of them out. So ah, excellent. Okay, good. So um, yeah, I, I, this is a, a good a good picture for uh, for confusion because it's a it's a purple finch on kind of the dull end of things. Um, however, it does have some of the 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 Overall purple finch characters of a rather a straight Coleman, no eye ring, uh, pronounced uh, streaks on the back, and smudgy streaks down what you can see of the flanks. Uh, there is a little bit of reddish color into the wings here, which is uh, which is something you would see in a purple finch and not a house finch. So uh, and and wings that are long enough that they're they're sticking out past the uh the the feathers of the of the upper tail coverts um into the into the tail I mean, those are some of these are a little a little dodgy to get from this picture but they are there um so that's pretty cool um let's see good all right so we've got we can we've got we've got progress to make so um good work everybody close that and move on to uh, what I want to say about Eastern purple finches. So all the purple finches I've shown so far have all been Western purple finches photographed here in California. 
uh, those are, uh, yeah, the Californica subspecies. Um, for, you know, when you mostly are reaching out to California birders to get uh, photographs, you mostly get photographs of California birds. But uh, fortunately, the Macaulay Library is loaded with all sorts of, of, uh, of pictures. So I picked a couple of very, um, I would say, identifiable Eastern purple finches. Now, as you can see from the Western purple finches that I showed, there's quite a lot of variation. So uh, there is variation in the Eastern birds as well. And uh, many of them, at least, are, were not identifiable by me by photographs. But I picked some ones that would that would show sort of the obvious marks of Eastern purple finch versus Western California purple finch. Uh, they still have the same basic bill shape with a mostly straight culmen, no eye ring, smudges down the flanks, uh, and then a suffusion of red feathers uh, beyond just what's around the uh, what's around the head and, and face and breast. So those things are, are kind of classic male purple finch, but they're also uh, streakier, more contrasty, and the background color of the underparts is whiter. So it makes the, the, the streaks that are on the underparts jump out a little bit more. So those are things to look for if you happen to be in, say, somewhere in the eastern deserts of California and find a, find a purple finch. Uh, you know, get some get some documentation because uh, Eastern Purple Finch could be on your radar and it might be identifiable as an Eastern Purple Finch. So that's, uh, you know, that's cool. All right, well, I'm gonna move on to Cassin's Finch. So here's a pretty typical uh, male Cassin's Finch. Um, as I said, like uh, sort of the, the, the overall field marks of this bird uh, it has, uh, it's very streaky above, but not very streaky below the males. Uh, the streaks that are present are pretty fine, well-defined, go out into the undertail coverts. Uh, the red on the head does, there's a, there's a suffusion on the underparts, but basically stops at the breast, but does go out into the upper parts. So there's red edged feathers in the wings on the back. Uh, it has a prominent eye ring. Uh, it has a bright red cap. This one, the cap is sticking up, which they, they do, which they, they do kind of often. Um, but it's the, it's the reddest part of the bird. So the rest of it might be sort of dull and washed red, but they have this bright red uh, uh, cap and crown. And the forecrown is often kind of puffed up like that. Uh, the bill is, uh, is, is very angular, conical uh, bill. Um, the facial pattern uh, is pretty is pretty pronounced uh, with, a, with a pale uh, supercilium and mustache bringing out the uh, the the auricular the cheek patch uh, and the darker uh, darker malar. So pretty typical Cassin's finch. Here's a couple more showing the same sorts of things, just a little bit of variation. So here's a good picture of the back. This was this is one that doesn't have so much red feathering into the into the wings, but does have some. So there's some, some reddish edged feathers, but uh, a very intensely streaky back. Uh, again, both of these birds show very, uh, very uh, angular, straight, sort of this one, a little bit of a curve, but a straightish Coleman uh, on the bill. Uh, this one on the lower left is uh, excellently shows how long the wings of a Cassin's finch can look. And again, sometimes it's difficult. I'm gonna show some variation, but I, I, Cassin's finch at least pretty consistently looks long winged, which also, as I said, makes the tail look short and the bird look kind of kind of dumpier uh, than, uh, than purple finch or, or house finch. Uh, some streaks on the flanks, uh, barely on the bird on the right, but on the left, some very fine, um, but, but uh, uh, well-defined little streaks, eye ring, so some, some classics. Uh, yeah, some uh, different views of cats and finches showing um, showing back streaking and uh, and underpart streaking, um, and now I'm going to move on to the female finches. And I guess what I should also point out in here is that um, cats and finches and purple finches, the uh, males don't get their uh, their, their male plumage, their, their adult male plumage until their second year. So um, immature birds um, look, like, look like females until their, until their second molt after their, after their first year. So uh, sometimes if you see, uh, uh, some, you hear a Cassin's finch or a purple finch singing from a, from a treetop uh, and you track it down, it looks like a female just like singing its heart out, um, it's, probably a first year male uh, finch. 
and it just hasn't it hasn't turned red yet. So uh, this is the the when I when I mention when I talk about females here, I'm talking about the uh, the the females and and immature uh, immature males. Um, so anyway, here's a house finch on the left, purple finch in the top right, and uh, Cassin's finch on the lower right. Uh, some of the the the, the, yeah, the global uh, field marks that we're looking for, yeah, the curved Coleman, uh, sort of an eye ring sometimes in house finch, not really in purple finch, and and pretty intense in white in Cassin's finch. Cassin's finch overall very streaky above and below, and streaks are very well defined uh, down the flanks all the way out into the undertail coverts. Uh, both purple finches and house finches have pretty smudgy streaks. Uh, with a, a, a dull sort of off-white background color. Uh, house finches on the back are, have, have indistinct streaking uh, and purple finches are more distinctly streaked. They're not as streaked as Cassin's finches. Both Cassin's finches and purple finches have a, uh, have a facial pattern um, brought out by the pale supercilium and mustache. So they have a darker malar and uh, auricular. Um, in Cassin's finch, this one shows it pretty well. Cassin's finch, you can sometimes see pretty intense streaking even in that auricular patch. Sometimes you can't, but you can in this one. Uh, but just another thing to look out for. Um, and let me move on. So some house finches, some female house finches, uh, kind of the typical view of house finches. Got They're hanging out in the grass of some urban park and there's a male and female together there and female on the left. Again, showing the, the, the field marks, sort of indistinct streaking on the back, smudgy streaks down the flanks, kind of a curved uh, Coleman, no eye ring. Um, this one, actually on the last one too, uh, looks pretty short winged and long tail. You can see where the tips of the, uh, the, the primaries, the primary feathers, the wings touch the, uh, the upper tail coverts uh, at the, uh, on, the, on the tail. Um, making the tail look longer, so less of a less of a stocky looking bird. Um, again, some some more pictures um, of of female house finches. Um, yeah, curved Coleman, um, indistinct uh, eye ring, uh, indistinct streaking, smudgy streak on the back, smudgy streaking down the sides, wings that sort of end up here in the uh, still in the upper tail coverts. So, all right. Purple finches. Uh, you could jump, but it should just jump right out after looking at the few house finches. How how different these things look. Um, there's a whole bunch of them at a bird feeder. Uh, one of the things that our western purple finches show is this sort of olive cast to them, and some of these birds show it. And I'll I'll show some more that that have this distinct olive tone, and that's that that can be a useful field mark. If you're only seeing part of a bird or something like that, that the that the western purple finches do show this this these olive tones. Um, the facial pattern of these birds is is very different from house finch. You know, with the especially the distinct supercilium um, and uh, streaks, intense streaking, uh, but smudgy above uh, above and below. So here's another one. This one on the left, it's showing the the, the very olive olive color that some of these things have. The one on the right being kind of a, uh, a lighter marked uh, purple finch, um, but the streaks are pretty smudgy. They're almost kind of like triangular or chevron shaped uh, going down the flanks with very little marks in the, uh, in the undertail coverts and, and no eye rings on, on either of these birds. So here's a few more. These show some of these show some of the smudgier marks that do make it down into the undertail coverts. That's often uh, cited as a, a point of identification between Cassin's finch and purple finch is the markings in the undertail coverts. Well, the western western purple finch females do show marks in the undertail coverts, but uh, like the rest of their markings are often pretty smudgy and kind of triangle shaped. Um, and when I show the Cassin's finch markings on the in the, the next couple of slides, so you can you can see the difference pretty easily. Um, but yeah, smudgily marked as a kind of a pale one in the middle, uh, with actually kind of pretty, pretty curved Coleman for a, for a purple finch on the, on the curvier side, uh, and some more boldly marked birds on both the, uh, the left and the right. All right. So, uh, these are Eastern purple finches, uh, that I got from the, uh, Macaulay library and like the male purple finches, the uh, the differences are about the about the contrast. 
so that the base feathers of the underparts are whiter in eastern purple finch than western purple finch, so they can look more contrasty below. Though the uh, the streaking uh, is still basically the same shape and making these little triangles or chevrons. Um, the undertail coverts of eastern purple finches is uh, significantly less marked than the western purple finches. Uh, but they still have the same facial pattern and, and bill shape. Uh, back can look a little bit streakier again because of the the, the differences uh, the, the, in the in the the degree of lightness and darkness of the feathers, making them uh, making them more contrasty birds. Um, so quiz finch number three is a purple finch. Uh, Ron, any? Uh, Okay. Yeah. Wow. People did pretty well on this one. So we got 46% uh, uh, saying that this was a purple finch, 20% uh, saying it's a house finch, and then uh, uh, odds and ends of the others, and then 20 more percent saying it's a Hamoro Espa. Uh, always, uh, always good to play conservative once in a while. Um, on this one, uh, what to look for, because there's some it's got some schmutz on the bill, so bill shape isn't exactly the uh, the most most useful here. But it doesn't have an eye ring. Uh, it's smudgily streaked uh, down the down the flanks. You see some little sort of triangle shaped like a purple finch. Uh, there's a little bit of this uh, olive coloration in the uh, in the back feather. So always a good mark for purple finch. And uh, this one has a pretty uh, a pretty dull facial pattern, but it is there. There's a little bit of the pale, pale supercilium and mustache here. Um, so, uh, this one, uh, this one is a purple finch. Uh, I just saw there's, a uh, uh, Alvaro Jaramillo in the, uh, in the chat says, uh, that the, the really olive, the strongly olive purple finches are young males. So cool. Yeah. That's, uh, good to know. So thank you, Alvaro. And, uh, let me move on to Cassin's finches. So these are the streakiest of our streaky finches. Um, and uh, actually this, this one on the right is, is, is so intensely streaky. I wonder if this is actually a, an immature bird, um, a young bird in the, in the breeding grounds. Um, but it's, uh, yeah, it's a, these, are, these are streaky above and below. The streaks are very well pronounced. They're very uh, like linear streaks. Uh, both of these birds showing, uh, showing white eye rings, um, the facial pattern, uh, similar to a purple finch with the, uh, with the white supercilium and, uh, and mailer. Um, the one on the left showing, uh, showing the long wings way out into the, the primary feather projection way out into the tail. Um, uh, conical, uh, straight Coleman bill. So here's a couple more. Um, and sometimes and these these both have it, and sometimes uh, the female plumage cassins finches do this sort of buff color tone to the uh, to the auricular patch. I don't always see it, but I but I sometimes do. I don't. I, I you know there may be another thing that this is related to a to a, a certain age or something. I, I don't know the answer to that, um, but uh, it is in some cassins finches. But these are yeah, you can see uh, yeah boldly streaked below, um, out into the undertail coverts. Uh, yeah, very streaky above, very angular bills. Uh, and here's a few more just showing some, uh, some variation in the, uh, in, in, in Cassin's finches. Um, yeah, this one on the bottom right showing some of that, that buff color in the auricular, but these two not showing very, uh, very intense uh, eye rings like they often do, at least not at these, this angle, but also very streaky above and below. Um, I can't remember which one this is. It's the undertail coverts of one of these two birds um, on the bottom left, just showing how you know very uh, intense streaks, um, but very linear. None, not the uh, the sort of little smudgy triangle chevrons like uh, like like house or um, like purple finches have. Uh, and quiz finch number two is a Cassin's finch. So how did people uh, how did people do on quiz finch number two, Ron? Yeah, all right, good. Yeah, pretty, uh, pretty evenly split actually between purple finch and Cassin's finch. Um, Thirty-nine percent saying purple finch, forty-two percent saying Cassin's finch, 
and a, uh, a smattering of other answers. Um, so yes, uh, purple finch, uh, uh, this, this bird was uh, hanging out here in um, one of my uh, uh, dumpy little parks in my neighborhood. Uh, and yeah, I think, I, I think the, the first, it was there for, for several weeks. And I think the first day I encountered it, I just saw it briefly and I, I put it as a uh, purple slash Cassin's Finch in my, uh, in my eBird checklist. Um, but then I went back with my camera and got pictures of it. And because uh, it, was, it was interesting and I knew I was going to be giving this talk. So, um, you know, got a bunch of photos of it and, uh, and, and recordings. So, um, but yeah, this, is, this was, could be a little tricky. It's got, uh, uh, it's, it's a little wet. So the, the pronounced streaking on the, on the under parts uh, is a little, it could be, a little, looks a little smudged out. Um, it's at an angle, you can't really see much of an eye ring on it. And it's also at an angle where the, where the, the colon, the, the upper mandible looks a little bit curved, but it is intensely streaked above and below. Um, and it does have something of an eye ring, even if you don't see sort of the upper arc of it, but more than I would expect in a, in a, in a purple finch. So that one is a Cassett's finch. Okay, so let me quickly go over, I was mentioning about finch wings. Cassin's finches being longer winged than purple finches and being longer winged than house finches. And this being, and, and actually, you know, some of these things are, you know, we're, we're looking at photos, we're looking at good photos. And a lot of times if you're in the field and you just have your binoculars and this thing's up in a treetop, it's going to be hard to see what the Coleman looks like or the eye ring or, or even the, uh, yeah, or the, or the wing projection. So it's sort of the, you know, what we're using to define field mark is kind of like, well, what can we get a good picture of and then look at later? And, um, you know, this is this is one of those things. And these are the top row are Cassin's finches, the middle row is purple finches, and the bottom row are house finches. And then I threw a common red pole over there on the far right, which has uh, which has very long skinny wings that uh, stick out way past the uh, the tertials. Uh, um, and so you can see that the, there is a little bit of variation just in the angle of the photograph being taken. But on, on average, actually, it looks like, yeah, the Cassin's finch does have pretty long wings. They stick out over the, uh, over the undertail coverts and out onto the tail. Purple finch kind of in the middle and house finch, uh, house finch has it, it's shorter winged. But like I said before, it sort of gives them the longer wings, give it a shorter tail to more of a, more of a dumpy look. Um, so and I also was talking about beak curvature. So here's, uh, here's uh, what a bunch of finch beaks look like. Uh, the, top, uh, the top row is uh, house finches of the right three. And there's a pale rose finch on the top left and a common rose finch in the, the next one over, uh, the, the Larry picture. Um, these, uh, those have very curved colmans and stubby bills. House finch is kind of variable. Um, I picked a couple of different couple of different sorts there. The middle one is pretty pretty curvy. The other ones are they're curvy as well, but slightly less curvy. Uh, the purple finches are mostly straight, but so you can see both in the middle one and the, the left hand one that there there is some curvature to it. And Cassin's finch are are very very straight build, very conical build. But that one in the bottom right uh, does show a little bit of curve. A smaller build bird. Um, uh, and then I put cross uh, re, uh, the juvenile red crossbill in the bottom right, which has an extremely curved bill, and uh, pine siskin just above that, which is a very short or not short, a very spiky, uh, straight edged uh, bill. So just to show them all together there, and eye rings as well, is that there is variation, but in all the pictures that I was showing, you know, I just picked some out of, I picked good ones here where that shows where an eye ring would be if it had it. Cassin's finches across the top, uh, purple finches through the middle and house finches on the bottom, that there is a variation in house finches. Some birds show something of an eye ring and others don't. Uh, but purple finches, the rule is that they don't show an eye ring. Now, there's exceptions to every rule and I'll, I'll show that. And then Cassin's finches, the, the rule, uh, is that they do have an eye ring, though it's, uh, as you can see on the two right-hand birds, it's not, always, uh, it's not always very clear. And in fact, seeing these things in the field might not be entirely clear either. So, you know, that's, uh, that's a nice thing about having a uh, long lens. So, like I said, the confusion alert sometimes is that uh, house finches, juvenile finches, um, 
juvenile house finches, juvenile purple finches, juvenile castings finches. If they, it, 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 I guess what I'm saying is the juvenile finches are streakier than the adult finches. So if it's a juvenile castings finch, it's just going to get it's going to be streakier than the streakiest finch. But if you're looking at a juvenile house finch, it's going to be streakier than the adult house finches. Juvenile purple finch to be streakier than uh, the uh, the adult purple finches. And the juvenile birds also have eye rings. So here's uh, you know these two uh, juvenile house finches. Uh, the streaks are pretty well defined. Uh, the the background is uh, feathers are a little whiter. Uh, now the streaks are still kind of like a dull gray brown color like house finches are so it's not there isn't a lot of confusion with say uh with with a cassin's finch there's also the facial pattern still isn't there it's still pretty plain faced um but if you were just looking at a couple of field marks uh which is you know always one of those those birding no-nos is uh if you're just looking for streaks or eye rings or something like that is to to look at the look at the whole look at the whole bird there's even full phyllo plumes sticking off this one on the right um so likewise, juvenile purple finches could be uh, could be could be pose some confusion out there um, when they have eye rings. The one on the left has a, an eye ring. The one on the right is a juvenile um, uh, eastern purple finch. So uh, a particularly streaky bird. But again, intense uh, yeah, some some pretty intense uh, uh, streaking uh, above and below. Um, but not uh, not those not those real fine streaks that a uh, that a Cassin's finch uh, would have. Uh, this bird on the left, uh, juvenile purple finch on the left here with a with a uh, with an eye ring. Uh, you can actually see it, this one too, where the this photo the the projection of the the wings uh, could be a helpful uh, a, a mark on this one that it doesn't that they don't stick out onto the tail. Um, yeah, well defined, uh, well defined streaking on it, but still kind of like fuzzy looking. And fortunately, juvenile finches usually aren't alone. Uh, this is juvenile house finch. I think it might even been this one from the previous photo uh, being fed by mom. Um, you know, see some phyllo plumes sticking up off its head, kind of fuzzy looking. Um, you know, its tail feathers aren't fully all grown in yet. So, uh, you know, fortunately, if you're seeing juvenile finches, they are probably with mom and dad. And quiz finch number five is a juvenile house finch. How do we do on this one, Ron? One second. And there we go. Okay, well, everybody did pretty well on this. 58% saying house finch and 24% saying Cassin's finch. So, and then odds and it adds and ends few house slash, actually, you know what? There was only, uh, I guess, house slash Cassin's, that's a right answer. And Hemoros uh, Spa is also a right answer. So people did pretty well on this one. Uh, yes, this is a, yeah, this is a juvenile house finch. Um, uh, like I said, I, I, I put this one up there because it does have some somewhat confusing characteristics. Uh, you know, very streaky above, some well-defined streaks on the uh, on the flanks and below and onto the undertail coverts, uh, and an eye ring. But it doesn't have the, the facial pattern of either a purple finch or a, or a cassin's finch. Um, and uh, well, I guess it's a, it's a juvenile. The wings don't stick very far out at all. Uh, it does have some, you can barely see some phy phyllo plumes, and there's a little bit of a yellow gape here. I guess what's also being left out of the picture is that there's a freeway right over here and a big construction site over to the right, which is you know classic house finch habitat. Um, so, uh, but yeah, everybody got this one pretty well. So that's that's good. All right, my the, the last thing I want to say about these streaky finches are sounds. So I'm going to go through a few of these. Actually, I'll just I'll run through all of them. Um, each one of these plays for about a minute so or, or less i tried to pick sounds between uh 30 seconds and a minute so um let's see how we're doing all right i can i got this we'll be done before 8 30. um with questions and stuff too i want to keep everybody all night but i do want to beat this subject to death so anyway i'm going to play house finch pretty much the a song that everybody is every birder uh, in, in the U.S. who's watching this is certainly familiar with this song. Uh, List in particular for um, this sort of upslurred buzzy zri sound that's uh, through the song, but particularly at the end. And that's a useful, uh, that's a useful feature for separating this from other kind of warbly, finchy songs. Oops, well, it's not, it doesn't want me to play it. 
No, nope, nope. All right, well, it's not even giving me the, uh, and I did, I might need to stop sharing this yeah, and share it with the sound. I did it right, exactly. but let me, let me just do that. So bear with me a moment, folks. Share sound. Okay, let's try this again. Oh, there we go. Okay, here we go. House Finch. Right, so that's the song of House Finch. Now, House Finch calls also should be familiar to everybody. It's reminiscent of House Sparrow, which could be calling at the same time in the same place. Um, the chirps are a little more variable, a little lighter and more musical than sort of the incessant chirping of House Sparrow, but um, I will play those too. Right now, uh, purple finch. I, I have both Western and Eastern songs here. I very picked uh, what I could, what I judged as being the most typical, uh, and and different from each other for uh, for clarity. Um, so the Western song, you know, I think of which I hear singing in my yard, uh, is uh, a discrete phrase. Less doesn't go on as much as either house finch or Cassin's finch does. Uh, it's a, a bubbly ascending warble, doesn't have those zri sounds or really any kind of rough sounds in it at all. Um, and uh, let me play that. Oops, uh -oh. now it's, it's doing this again. Oh, there it goes. Okay, uh, Eastern purple finch song is uh, is more variable than Western purple finch song. I could uh, give me problems, um, you know, on on occasion with uh, with with house finch or or with with Cassin's finch. I suppose uh, that it doesn't it, it has less discrete phrase, uh, phrases, kind of goes on a little bit, a lot more variation in it. But it is pretty it is pretty light and bubbly and doesn't have those hard zri sounds of uh, of house finches so let me play that uh, where'd, my, where'd my cursor go there it is over. All right, well, the other thing that purple finches do and Cassin's finches do it as well is these two and three note calls um, that are very reminiscent of uh, the song of a solitary vireo. And uh, I, 
I really, I don't have a good way of telling these two apart just by, by playing it like this. And I don't have the, I don't have the spectrograms. So I don't have the, uh, I, I don't have a visualization of these, uh, of these calls to put to, to play, but uh, I do want to play them because they certainly do uh, cause some confusion. And uh, when I hear these someplace, it's you know, it's often exciting because I either I think it's going to, you know, it's going to be a Vireo and it's a Finch or I think it's going to be a Finch, it's a Vireo and I want to go track it down and find out what, what's making the sound. But uh, let me play this for you. And it's not quite as deliberate or I guess uh, hard as a as a Vireo song, but it it's uh it's got the got the cadence pretty good. So there's there's room for confusion. Now uh Purple Finch has a pretty distinctive flight call, these little like I I think of them as drier than this than this recording, these little like tick noise noises that it make that they make when they're flying around. Um and uh very helpful if you're in a place where there are purple finches because a lot of times like goldfinches you hear them you hear them flying over um before you uh before you see them so let me play these Okay, I'm gonna play Cassin's Finch song. Uh, Cassin's Finch, uh, like Purple Finch, is a uh, is a is and House Finch is a is a warbly song. Uh, Cassin's Finch mixes a little bit of mimicry into their songs. Uh, so sometimes you hear little yeah little parts of other bird songs, little thrushy, fluty sounds, or um, or, or some other song from the range of the bird. There's a, in the middle of this recording. There's a thick billed fox sparrow singing. So that's not. At least I don't think so. I don't think it's part of the, the Mad Cass and Sphinx song, but it's in there. And then the, this this recording ends with a couple of like the um, the very typical Cass and Sphinx calls, as sort of like pit slick sounds. Uh, so that's at the that's at the end of this recording. So let me play that right now. Okay, and let me finish this with the Cassin's Finch's uh, uh, two and three note phrases, similar, both similar to Solitary Vireo and to, uh, and to Purple Finch, but also a thing that Cassin's Finch's do. So I want to have that out there.
right, well, that covers all that. So I think uh, hopefully I've beaten all this to death and, and nobody's gonna be confused about this anymore. So I'm gonna move on real quick to some other streaky finches. Uh, showed pictures of both of these already, noting their uh, the bill shape, but both of these uh, juvenile red crossbills are definitely streaky finches. Uh, pretty prominently streaked below, kind of uh, you know roughly Cassin's finch like with those uh, those those well defined streaks under the undertail. So maybe if you were looking at this from below up in the tree, uh, uh, could pose some confusion. But presumably there's gonna be a bunch of other red crossbills with it. So um, uh, you know, and, and if you see the bill, then you know it's gonna be pretty obvious. Um, pine siskin also occurs with all of these other birds and pine siskins and purple finches and house finches and you know and goldfinches all can be at a feeder at the same time. Uh, pine siskin you know, being a smaller little goldfinch, uh, yellow in the wings and uh, in the tail, spiky little bill, um, a lot of uh, a lot of distinct noises. So unlikely to be confused with these, but another streaky finch. And then some of the kind of less usual ones. Uh, there are numerous records of uh, common red pole, mostly for Northern California. Um, however, there are three records for Southern California. Uh, the one on the left was photographed in the mountains of San Diego County uh, in, uh, in, in Julian. And um, uh, consistent with the usual time of year that these things show up in the, the late winter, February-ish, uh, the one on the right is one of two that were remarkably found on San Clemente Island, and those were in April, or I'm sorry, in May and June. So uh, outside of the time when these things usually occur, uh, far south of their range uh, here in California. Pretty distinctive, though, uh, st pretty streaky all over, uh, long winged um, with that with that red pole, that little red, that red cap and that little black bib. So. Um, probably unlikely to be confused with the others, uh, but yeah, put out a put out a bird feeder and you know see what happens. Uh, this one on the left looks like it likes thistle. Uh, so I guess even less likely, um, but you know I guess if a Eurasian tree sparrow or a short-tailed albatross or a magpie can get off of a boat in L.A. Harbor, so can a common rose finch. Um, if there's a uh, this one on the top left uh, was actually the one and only record of this bird for California, uh, photographed in September, it was 2007 on Southeast Farallon Island off of uh, San Francisco. Um, very plain, uh, a lot of, this is, a, this is a, uh, an immature bird, very plain, um, very olive uh, tones to all of its feathers, uh, streaky, but pretty indistinct streaking, very stubby, uh, uh, rounded bill. Uh, the, there's a male in the, uh, in the, in the bottom, um, also very plain, not very patterned, um, unlike uh, purple finch or Cassin's finch, but a little bit more like house finch, but again, real stubby curved bill, and plus all that red that's suffused through the back feathers, so pretty, uh, pretty distinct. Um, and that was, I think that, I think I, I got that photo from, that was from uh, the Macaulay Library, but I think from, uh, I think from ADAC in the Aleutians, where it's, it's rare, but it's a it's a regular vagrant there. Uh, I think mostly in the spring, but it's a yeah rare but regular vagrant. So it, and and widespread through Europe and Asia. So and then the top right, more problematic, would be this sort of worn adult female uh, common rose finch, very plain. Actually, uh, without looking too hard at, it, it's almost like it looks like a Lazuli bunting, but uh, uh, olive tones. Even though worn, you can see olive tones to the upper parts and that uh, uh, stubby little bill. So that wraps it up and uh thank you all for listening while i rambled through all that and uh, you know, uh finch on and i will take as many questions as i can before people um people get tired of listening to me well john actually that was really interesting i really enjoyed it um james zimmer jim zimmer uh asks asks i can't even speak is red set during feather growth or variable after the feathers grow? No, this is, uh, they, they grow in that color. So this is uh, whatever their, um, uh, their food and metabolism is uh, generating. Uh, those carotenoid pigments are being added to the feathers during growth. Um, I have seen a picture of, I, I presumably cassins and purple finches have, uh, can be yellow or orange as well. I have seen a picture of a purple finch, a pretty yellow looking purple finch, but 
I, I would expect that cast and switches probably can have that happen to them too, but maybe without the range that they're in, uh, less variation in, um, uh, in their metabolisms and in their diets, it just doesn't happen as frequently. Mm, okay, okay. And Don White, I think it is, uh, is there any difference in the vireo-like vario calls of purple and chasms? Good question. Um, maybe, and I haven't done my homework on this. Uh, it's they, they confuse me. So um, I don't know if I can um, reliably tell the two apart in the field. Uh, I always, when I, when I hear one, I try to track it down. Um, there might be. And uh, someone who has a, a better ear for this than I do would, ha would have to uh, answer the question. Or I'd have to come back and get a bunch of sonograms and line them all up and see if I can figure it out. Well, Kimball uh, responds that, oh, I just lost you, Kimball. Uh, Kimball would be a good one to respond to this. Uh, Kasson's calls are consistently squeakier. OK. Cool. I'll buy that, definitely. And Alex asks, has the expansion and success of house finch been detrimental to any other species? Mm, good, uh, good question. Mm -hmm. um, difficult to say, I think, because it's so, so much correlated with the alteration of the habitat by, by humans, which has been detrimental to lots of species. Um, so I, 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 honestly, I honestly don't know if we'd be able to decorrelate those two. Mm, yeah, yeah. Um, Alvaro asks, um, comment on mim mimicry and purple finch, they do it commonly, but it happens in a separate song type than the normal song. This secondary song has distinctive downward series of notes interspersed in this, in this song, it is also longer, more run on and varied. Huh. Hmm. Cool. Thank um, you, Alvaro. Yeah, and that could be uh, problematic if um, uh, if you were uh, yeah in in identification with uh, with Cassin's Finch, which does that as well. Um, oh, I see uh, Narish uh, commenting on oh uh, usefulness of uh, notched tails. Uh, Maybe both purple finch and Cassin's finch have a pretty notched tail, less so in house finch. Um, if you're looking at the notch of a tail, you probably, if you're looking up underneath the bird or in, in it's such an angle that you can notice the notch in the tail, uh, there's probably more useful field marks that are also visible. Um, but uh, both Cassin's and uh, purples have more notched, a more notched tail than house finch does. Okay. And here you go, John, from Ken. Oh, okay. Uh, yeah. Um, okay. Ken Ely says, I didn't mention the brown cap of male house finch. Uh, is that feature not as important in a, an otherwise confusing specimen? Um, I left it out. Um, yes, it's, that's, it, it's, it's, it's relevant. Um, there are... I think other things that are that are more helpful and the amount of red is is variable, at least in in purple finches and house finches. So I I didn't really consider it as being like a, a particularly uh, helpful mark. Um, but if it does have a brown cap, it's probably not a purple finch and, and certainly not a Cassin's finch. <laughs> That's very true. Very true. Um, John, that was excellent. Excellent. Mark, someone that's always had trouble with house finches, how do you feel? Oh, I thought it was fantastic. Yes. Th John, thank you very, very much. Um, you everything very you well. want to know. Thanks. Oh, uh, everything you always want to know about uh, finches, but we're afraid to ask. Uh, finches are kind of one of those first kinds of birds that you run into and then you never really you're too busy chasing short-tailed albatrosses and all that and never really get into finches and uh thank you very much for helping us along that way we appreciate it cool well you're welcome yes and... thanks that was great that was really a, a a very informative talk about uh the details of finches that i 
going to use in the field. Yep. Lots of thank yous. And Lily uh, asks one more question. I think it'll be our last. Oh, yeah. So uh, I heard that there are more yellow male house finches in Hawaii. Is it because there is less food that gives them their red, red pigment? Um, I, I don't know the answer to that, but I would say probably that's that's right. Um, they they are it, it, if it's it's either a, a, a difference in their metabolism or in the in the in their diet. So uh, Hawaii is a pretty different place. So it might be that the things that grow there that they're eating are just not providing them with the chemicals that they need to uh, um, make their uh, the, the red pigments. So that's likely. Excellent. Excellent. Well, again, thank you very, very much. We really appreciate it. And uh, we hope to see you in the field soon, John. Mm -hmm. And um, with that, thank you all very much. Please go to our website at labirders.org to catch the recording of this and all of our, just about all of our previous um, webinars. And um, uh, and we already have a hint as to what's coming up next month. You can check on our website for webinars next month and also for any other activities we may be having. And with that, I will see you all in the field. Thank you very much. Thank you, John. Thanks, yeah, John. Welcome. See y'all.